In this course, you're going to learn to use Docker Compose, but at a very high level, let's take a look at what life will be like without Docker Compose so that we have a better appreciation for it. Without Docker Compose, you would usually uh, use a single command to pull the image, and then there are several commands you would use to act on housekeeping of that image and to run it in a container and so on and so forth. Now, imagine that <clears throat> you're doing this for just one image. If you have several images, now you have to run these same commands and do this whole thing repeatedly for another image. And then when you have a third image, you'll realize that you have to do it again for a third image. All of this now means that you have three separate containers trying to live together. But suppose you could put it all in just one file and run that file so that you create one time operation that leads it into building a whole container ecosystem and then it's easy to just do housekeeping on that entire ecosystem you can destroy that ecosystem offload it and pull it up whenever you feel like that's the beauty of docker compose in this lesson we're going to pull a mysql server image from the docker hub we're going to run the image in a container and then we're going to perform some setup in that container before the image can be useful so let's go ahead and pull the image and it should take uh, just a few seconds and once that image is pulled let's do a docker images command to confirm that we have the image and there's the image so now let's go ahead and run the image in a container we can do the docker run command and that will give us a container ID and now we can do a docker ps to confirm yep and there's the container now the uh, every container has a volume where a disk volume is attached this is where all the data will live, uh, live uh, from mysql server so if we do a docker volume ls there it is we actually have a default uh, disk now what we need to do is go inside the container and uh, uh, log in as root in MySQL. Now, in order to do that, we need to go to the logs to pick up a generated password that was created just now. And so there's the password in the log and there's the actual generated password. So let's go ahead and log in as root using that generated password. So I'm going to go ahead and execute the docker exec command. And I'm going to copy and paste that password. And that will get me inside a MySQL session. Now my next step is to reset the password to something easier that I can remember. So I'm going to do a alter user command, a typical SQL uh, command, and I'm going to set it to root. So my password now is root. So if I log in as root using the password root that I just created, I should be in. So now what I'm going to do is create a brand new user. Now this user will have uh, privileges uh, just like a admin would. So I created a admin user. I'm going to go ahead and uh, give this user all the permissions necessary uh, as an admin. So I'm going to give the grant all privileges. And now I'm going to do a flush of those privileges so that it will stick back to the MySQL uh, uh, database. And that should take care of that. So now I'm going to log out. And I'm going to log back in as the new admin ID that I just created. And that will get me inside the MySQL session. Now I'm going to take a look at all the databases that are out there. I'm going to go ahead and create one called MyDB. So let's go ahead and create the database. There you go. And now I'm going to take a look at the list again, and I should see my DB right there. So this is basically how I created all of my setup. Now see how hard it was? Many, many steps were involved. Now let's see how easy it is to do the same exact thing using Docker Compose. 
So before we jump into Docker Compose, let's now do a cleanup first. So first we need to make sure that we stop the running container. And then after that, we need to make sure that we have removed the volumes and uh, uh, offloaded the Docker, the MySQL image. So I just gave a Docker stop command to stop the container. And there you go. The container has stopped, which uh, echoes back the container ID. If you do a Docker PS, you'll notice there is no running container. If I do a Docker PS minus A, the container history is still there. So I'm going to remove the container completely out. And that's how you do that. So if I now do a Docker PS, it's completely gone. So the container has been stopped and removed. And now we need to take a look at the, uh, uh, the container volume that was created. So let's take a look at the volume and it should still be there. There it is. Now let's take the volume name and go ahead and remove the volume from our uh, uh, volume stack there. And that should clean out the volume, the disk and everything that was in it is, is gone now. And the next step now would be to remove the Docker image. We still need to offload the Docker image that is still within our images. So I'm going to do a RMI command and there it is. It has unloaded and deleted the Docker image. And so this is basically how you do an entire cleanup. And as you see, there are a lot of steps just to do that. Now let's take a look at how to do all this using a Docker Compose. Let's begin by creating a Docker Compose.yaml file. The first thing we want to do is identify the version number, which is 3 in our case, followed by actual services. Our service first is going to be MySQL, so we identify a container name, and then we identify the image name that we want to pull from Docker Hub, followed by the volume name, uh, so we're going to give a name of the volume and the path to it, followed by the environment variables that are going to be used by Docker Compose to generate a root password, followed by the actual database name, followed by the user ID and password for the admin user that we want to create. Then we need to identify the port numbers, and then finally the actual volume name that will be used by the entire container. Let's save all this in a docker compose.yaml file and then let's move on to executing the docker compose. So let's execute our docker compose. You do so by doing docker compose up minus d. That'll begin downloading the MySQL image and it's going to start uh, generating the necessary setup values and everything and run MySQL into a container it actually started creating the Docker Compose network and you'll notice the volume is also created and now at this time the container is running now. So if we do a quick Docker space images we should be able to confirm that the image is now downloaded. There we go. And if you do a Docker PS you can see that the container is up and running right there. Now how can we be sure everything is there? Let's do a quick uh, let's do a quick look at Docker logs for MySQL, and let's see what's in there. So as you can see, the logs have indicated that MySQL ran. It initialized the database uh, right there. Uh, that statement uh, shows us that it executed all of our root password setup and the admin ID setup. It then started to go ahead and begin the uh, uh, startup process to bring up the MySQL server. So uh, there's every indication looking at the logs here that uh, MySQL ran successfully, created all of our setup. Now let's go inside a uh, MySQL shell. I'm going to log in as the root using the root password. And there it is. I'm inside the MySQL session. If I do show databases, I should be able to see my DB. And that is it right there. Let's go ahead and uh, exit. And I'm going to try to log in as the admin user that we created. Uh, if you recall, the password is admin. 
So let's log in and I'm going to enter the password admin and I should be in the MySQL session. Let's do a show databases and there you go. There's my DB and of course this is the admin database uh, ID so I may not see a lot of the other uh, pertinent MySQL internal databases. So I'm going to go ahead and exit <clears throat> and now let's take a look at the volume. We created a volume with the name DB uh, hyphen data and there it is. It created our volume uh, and, and this is a very easy readable volume name compared to the large generated one that we saw in the last lesson. So this is how e easy it is. I mean I did not even uh, have to execute all of those mundane statements that we did in our previous lesson. So this is how Docker Compose actually runs everything, creates the container and the IDs and passwords. Now let's try and bring everything down. So when you do a Docker Compose down and volumes, it's going to stop the MySQL server and it's doing that right now. It's going to destroy the volumes. It's going to bring down the network. It's going to do all of that. These are commands that we individually executed, if you recall, in our last lesson. And in Docker Compose, it just does it all automatically in just one fell swoop. So if I do a Docker volumes, whoops, I misspelled it there. If I tie, recorrect that and uh, just do Docker volume, you see, there's no more volumes. And if I do the same with uh, the images, and, and PS, I can see the container is gone. There you go. And if I do a Docker images, my image is still there. So it's time to now clean up everything. So there's a new command called Docker system prune minus A that will basically kill the image, bring everything else down, clear up the caches, everything. And there you go. So it brought everything down. Uh, took uh, offloaded the uh, Docker uh, MySQL image. So this is basically how easy it is to use Docker Compose and just run everything in just one little file and uh, uh, saves you a lot of trouble and uh, makes it very clean. In this section we're going to learn about adding multiple containers to a Docker Compose. So let's start with the version number three and then identify the services. First is going to be MySQL and if you recall from previous lesson we added the root password, created the database on the fly, added a user ID and a password and a port number. Now we need to add some Kafka uh, elements to this. Uh, we're going to start with Zookeeper and that's going to give a container name, we're going to give a port number um, and the next followed by Kafka information. Uh, we have a container name, uh, port number 9092 and then we're going to go ahead and actually identify the Kafka host name and the topics that we're going to create. As you can see we have topic 1 and 2 and then we are creating a volume for Kafka to store its uh, topic message data as well as uh, some metadata that goes along with uh, the Kafka container. We're going to create a Docker Compose YAML out of this and then we're going to execute it to create our containers. Now we're going to take the multi-container Docker Compose file that we created and uh, execute it to create our three containers. We have the MySQL, Kafka and Zookeeper containers. So now let's go ahead and execute our Docker Compose and then you will notice that it has created our network right there and it's created the uh, MySQL uh, database volume. It's now pulling the MySQL image from Docker Hub and now it's pulling the Zookeeper image. Uh, you'll notice uh, we are pulling the Wordmeister Zookeeper image from Docker Hub. Um, Momentarily, it's going to start pulling the Kafka image just in a few more seconds. And here we go, creating now the uh, Kafka image. It's pulling from uh, Wordmeister in Docker Hub. And as soon as the Kafka image is pulled, we're going to start creating our three containers. There we go, we are creating the Zookeeper, MySQL and Kafka containers right there. 
as you can see. And now we need to do a Docker images command to make sure that uh, the three images are pulled. So let's confirm that. And there they are. Got the MySQL, the Kafka, and Zookeeper image. Now let's try and uh, take a peek at the uh, containers. Make sure they're running fine. And there's our Kafka image right there, followed by Zookeeper and MySQL. They all seem to be running just fine. And now <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, let, let's gain access into the MySQL container. We're going to log in as the admin user with uh, the password is admin, if you recall from the Docker Compose. And here we are. We are inside the MySQL session. Let's take a look at the databases. And there's the MyDB database that we created. And now if we exit out of there, and let's take a look at the volumes that have been created. Uh, there should be volumes created for all three containers. Uh, these are the Kafka, Zookeeper, and MySQL volume. The MySQL volume is clearly labeled right there. The other three are the Kafka and Zookeeper volumes. Uh, you'll notice they are not as clearly labeled as the MySQL, but uh, that's what they are. They are the Zookeeper and Kafka volumes. If we take a look at the MySQL container logs, we will see that the process is in action where it actually starts creating the database with user IDs and passwords and uh, uh, the actual uh, database itself. So if you look at that right there on the logs, it says it's finished the initialization process and the engine is now starting up. But if we scroll up a little bit, that's where you will notice right there it says database has been initialized now this is where it created all your user ids and passwords and the database and now finally the mysql container engine is up now and this is how we create the mysql database take a look at our kafka container i've broken up this terminal window into three tabs the first tab is where commands will be executed the second tab is where the producer will produce messages and the third tab is where we'll consume those messages. Now, this is based on the two topics that we created. But for our demo here, we are just going to be using topic one. So let's take a look at our images. Make sure we have uh, Kafka images. There you go. We got the Kafka and the Zookeeper image still there. Let's uh, do a quick uh, check on our containers. Make sure they're running. And there's the Kafka container and the Zookeeper container. Now let's take a look at uh, the volumes that uh, currently exist out there. We should see the, the three volumes for the Zookeeper, Kafka, and the topics. And then a third volume is the uh, MySQL database that you see there. So the first three unnamed volumes are the Kafka volumes. So now let's go ahead <clears throat> and get inside the zookeeper uh, and take a look at the topics that we have created so we're going to examine the zookeeper container and list the topics and there you go there we have two topics uh, that we created from our docker compose and now we're going to take a look at the producer now why don't we go ahead and uh, execute the producer so let's go ahead and activate the producer and then the consumer will echo back the message that it will pick up from the topic so if you go back to the producer tab and let's go ahead and hit the enter key let's go to the consumer tab and hit the enter key there so now the producer is ready to produce so let's post a message hello there and if we hit enter and go to the consumer there it is the message is uh, seen right there if we go back to producer and put something else like how are you and we go to the uh, consumer right after we should be able to see the message right there how are you 
So this is basically how the producer and consumer uh, actions are occurring on our uh, Kafka container. Now if we take a quick uh, look at the logs for instance, so if we look at the uh, zookeeper log first and uh, uh, let's take a look at the Kafka log first and uh, you can see the uh, log is displaying uh, various uh, uh, topic settings. Uh, it's setting up the offsets. It's loading the offsets and the group metadata. So this indicates that your Kafka topics are being set up and the Kafka engine is uh, running now. If we look similarly in the Zookeeper logs, you're going to see similar setup being uh, displayed in the logs. It's uh, running all the Zookeeper uh, session uh, properties and it's activating our zookeeper sessions for each of the topics and if you go up there uh, you can see all of the environment uh, setup that's that's occurring so this is how the zookeeper is uh, creating its environment and uh, getting the container ready <clears throat> so this is basically how the Kafka container is is running and, and being loaded in our Docker Compose. Now that we have explored the MySQL, Kafka, and Zookeeper containers, let's uh, start examining the process of shutting down the containers and offload the images. Before we do that, let's do a quick check on our producer and consumer, and they seem to be still running. Let's do a Docker PS to examine our containers, and they're still up and running which is good. Let's uh, take a close look at our uh, volumes. So let's check, uh, type in the command docker volume to see what uh, disk volumes are still out there. And we have our three disks for the Kafka Zookeeper and the topics and of course the fourth one for MySQL. Now let's go ahead and Issue the docker compose down command to bring down the containers and destroy the volumes. So let's go ahead and execute that. And as you can see, it's stopping the MySQL, Kafka, and Zookeeper containers. And pretty soon it's going to start offloading and destroying the networks. See, it's removing our uh, containers from the stack. It's uh, removing our network that it had created in the docker compose and the volume it got rid of. So now <clears throat> if we take a look at our uh, volumes uh, we should see nothing and if we go and take a look at our containers they're gone they have been shut down my producer has stopped this uh, producing as you can see it has completely shut down if we look at the consumer, that has completely stopped listening to anything in the topic, and that has shut down. And now, let's take a look at our images. Our images are probably still out there. There's the MySQL server, the Kafka, and Zookeeper. So what we want to do now is to stop the images and offload them by doing the system prune command, and just respond why. And there it is. All the images have been uh, offloaded. There's the MySQL image. And then uh, you'll see the Zookeeper has been offloaded and deleted. And if you scroll down and look at Kafka image has been offloaded and destroyed. And if you really look, it took about 1.307 gigabytes of disk space to run all three containers. So now if I do a Docker images, I should be seeing nothing. So this is basically how you do multi-container Docker Compose. Let's look at an application ecosystem that uh, could be created through a Docker Compose that will be true to real life. What we have here is a Kafka server with a topic. In the middle, we have a Spring Boot microservice. Let's call it test app. 
and then in the back we have a MySQL Server database. Now there are two entry points into the application. The one entry point comes through as a message payload into the Kafka topic. Another entry point would be a similar payload coming in through a REST API exposed by the Spring Boot microservice. So if we get a payload through the Kafka topic, that would then get consumed by the Spring Boot uh, microservice uh, as a consumer. And then the Spring Boot microservice will then send that payload to the backend database. So this is one pathway. Another is the REST API. So if the same kind of payload comes through a REST API, goes into and consumed by the Spring Boot microservice, which is then uh, sent to the database. So now you have these two entry points, the Kafka message and the RESTful endpoint. Um, so these are the two ways that uh, our Spring Boot microservice will uh, populate the database. Now this is very true to life. So let's figure out how we can put this all into a Docker Compose and actually see this in action. So here we are inside IntelliJ. Uh, we are looking at the micro uh, Spring Boot microservice called Test App. And if we uh, examine the uh, microservice closely, it's a Gradle project. And uh, this is what the uh, source code structure looks like. It's a typical of a Spring Boot microservice. And then this is what the application YAML file looks like. Uh, nothing unusual about it. Typical uh, parameters. And uh, if we look closely at the Docker file, uh, I've already set up the Docker file uh, to basically take the compiled jar from the build directory, as usually happens. And then it's going to pick up the uh, application YAML file that we looked at earlier. And it's going to take the <coughs> jar file and the application YAML and copy it into the image. Uh, I have the wait for it shell script that will uh, delay the loading of uh, the Spring Boot microservice uh, because it takes a long time for MySQL to start up. So it's going to stop for a while and wait for MySQL to load up. And then it'll uh, proceed to starting the Spring Boot microservice. So if we look at the Docker Compose file, uh, you will notice the typical, uh, we use version 3.0 and then we define our services. Just as before, we have our typical MySQL uh, service defined with the image and container name. We have defined our database and our uh, uh, user IDs. We doing the same thing with the Zookeeper and Kafka. <coughs> we are going to be creating uh, two topics. And uh, then we are going to declare our Spring Boot microservice right there. And uh, we're going to call it test app as our container. And it's going to build an image with the jar file that we just uh, declared in the Docker file uh, that you saw just a few moments ago. It's going to use that uh, jar file and the application YAML to build up the test app image. Uh, the microservice will run on port 8080 and we are going to depend on these services to start up uh, MySQL, Kafka and Zookeeper. So we are declaring our app name, the database uh, information that will be picked up by the YAML file. And it's all that uh, root password and user ID and so on and so forth that we declared up there. We do use Liquibase in this project, which is a uh, course that I uh, teach uh, uh, separately. Uh, we use Liquibase for schema migration. Uh, those are the topics, and that's our bootstrap Kafka server. And this is the command we execute <coughs> to purposely delay the loading of the Spring Boot microservice. It's going to wait for MySQL to start up, and that's what that command is for. So it's going to keep on polling MySQL on that port number 
until it's up and that's roughly probably takes about 30 seconds and then it's going to execute the uh, app.jar and that's going to load up our Spring Boot microservice. So this uh, basically is what the uh, Docker Compose looks like. Um, not much different than what you have seen before except for the Spring Boot microservice. Now if we look at IntelliJ provides a nice little environment, the GUI environment where we can actually see the Docker Compose containers uh, that are loaded. So if we examine our Docker Compose, I've already run it because it does take a little bit. So there's our networking, there's our uh, Workmeister, Kafka, and Zookeeper images have been loaded into a container and that's our test app right there. Uh, and there's all the steps that were taken to execute the Docker file contents to create the image and then uh, load it as a container. So now we have all these containers ready, loaded, and set to go. So let's take a look <coughs> quickly at the Kafka logs and uh, you'll notice the Kafka logs are usually very verbose, uh, a lot of information there. Uh, what I'm looking for is our two uh, topics uh, that we ask the Docker Compose to help create. And uh, the topic one and topic two are right there. It's uh, created the two topics for us, right there. So those topics are up and running. Uh, same with MySQL. Uh, we created our database. It got initialized with all of the database creation steps that we had identified in uh, the Docker Compose. And there's our test app. So our test app has done its usual thing that it does to load up the app. Uh, it also creates a connection since it is a consumer on topic one of the Kafka server. There it is. It's uh, created a connection to the appropriate topic right there. And finally, the spring microservice started. So now it's ready to go. So all the, all the containers are up and uh, ready to take uh, uh, any traffic. So let's uh, take a close look at uh, what we're going to do now is take the first route. If you recall the PowerPoint, we are going to now <clears throat> send a, a user uh, ad request to the Kafka topic one that we had created right there. And this is going to be the producer that actually creates the request to create the user uh, user record. And then what we're going to do is we're going to actually go into the MySQL database and we're going to log in as admin. The password is also admin. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, the MyDB database. And there it is. It's created when the Spring Boot microservice started. So let's uh, go into MyDB and uh, we are looking for a table called user. So in our exercise here, we are going to try to populate a record in the user table. So currently, there's probably nothing in the user table right now. So if we run a quick query <clears throat> on the table, you will see that there is absolutely nothing in there. So what we plan, plan to do is we plan to send a payload to the topic one message uh, requesting for a user to be uh, created. And if you recall the PowerPoint, uh, it's going to actually uh, enable the uh, test app microservice to consume that topic. And evidently, it's going to take in and consume the message, which is the actual uh, payload to create the user. So uh, here I am creating the payload. It's a simple JSON. Uh, it's looking for just two elements in the payload, just a name and an email address. And it's going to actually auto generate the ID because uh, we had set that up in the microservice. So if I uh, hit the enter key, it's going to create a record with name Sean Connery and uh, it's going to create an email address uh, in the database called sconnery at 007.com. A little bit uh, of pun intended there. 
So now let's go into the database and see if the uh, record actually exists now. And there it is. We just created it. The ID is set to one. Name Sean Connery. Email sconnery at 007.com. So this is how the, uh, the first flow through the uh, 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 Kafka topic will flow. Now let's try adding a user using the RESTful API route. So I'm in the Swagger page now of the uh, Spring Boot uh, microservice test app. And I'm going to open up user controller. As you can see, there is a post and a get. We need to go to the post to add a user. So let's go into the post. And uh, I'm going it, to, it's asking for a email address and a name. So let's go ahead and put in an email address. This time, let's go for another James Bond character, uh, Roger Moore at universalexports.com. And for the name, we're going to put in uh, Roger Moore. And uh, once we have done that, if we just click on the execute uh, button, the response back clearly says uh, Roger Moore has been added. So now if we go to the database and uh, run ourselves a quick query on the user table, we'll, we should be able to see Roger Moore added. And there it is. There's Roger Moore right there. So this is how the RESTful endpoint is, uh, is going to do uh, adding of a user. Uh, if I change now, let's let's try another user. If I change now to a, a comedian I'm, I've been very fond of, the late Robin Williams at comedy.com, and let's change the name to Robin Williams and uh, hit the uh, execute button. I should be able to see another response saying that Robin Williams has been added, and there it is. Once again, if we go back to the database and run a quick query, we should see Robin Williams. So as you can see, each time it incremented the ID value uh, automatically. So now if I go to the get method, there is a get method which will return all of the records that are in the database. So if I go into get, and uh, let's try this one out. And if I click on execute, it's going to basically list all of these rows that are in the database that we put in so far. And that's what's going to be returned as a JSON payload. So if we look there, there we go. That's the response that we got back from the RESTful endpoint. It shows all three rows that were put into the database. So this is how uh, the... Uh, RESTful endpoint uh, flow works, uh, shows you uh, uh, a get and a post uh, to display what's in the database. IntelliJ provides an ex excellent interface to uh, work with Docker Compose. So let's take a look at uh, our current Docker Compose. And uh, uh, we can uh, use this user interface to actually uh, bring down our images and our containers. But before we do that, let's make sure our containers are still up and running. And uh, they seem to be. Uh, so that's good. So let's go back to our Docker Compose. And uh, if we click on that uh, red stop button right there, that will begin the Docker uh, Compose process should stop all the containers and momentarily we are going to start seeing uh, the containers stopping and uh, if we further go down and look at that down button and if we click that that will actually bring down the the volumes and the network and, and everything similar to how we used to manually do docker compose down so if we do a docker ps uh, there's no containers left anymore and if we do a quick uh, images list we still have our images out there let's take a quick look at uh, our volumes they should be gone by now so let's take a listing of our volumes and yep they're gone 
So now let's do a Docker total cleanup of the Docker system prune minus A. And that should uh, shut down and offload all of the images. So there's our uh, test app, the microservice, uh, Spring Boot microservice, and then the Zookeeper image is offloaded, uh, followed by SQL Server and Kafka down below. And then you'll notice finally the open JDK image is also taken down. Uh, curiously, all of that took 1.99 gigabytes of space. Uh, that's that's uh, not bad. All these services running with uh, just that much. So that's basically how you use Docker Compose to run an entire application ecosystem. Uh, pretty cool stuff. All that in just a little Docker Compose file. So thanks for watching.